Thank you, Gary. Uh, we're thrilled to have Peter Barth today as the keynote speaker. Peter is the founder and the CEO of the Iron Yard, which started in Greenville, South Carolina, and now has expanded to four additional locations in the Southeast. The Southeast was the textile capital of the world. The industry at the time moved out, and the city experienced decay. The downtown was a dangerous place. But over the last five to 10 years, Greenville has been fully transformed into a vibrant startup community and listed as one of the best cities for young <coughs> professionals. The Iron Yard has been at the center of this economic transformation. The Iron Yard is a business accelerator, a working space, and a programming school for adults and kids. Peter has taken many leadership roles in addition to the, uh, the one in the Iron Yard. Uh, he's, he's in the he was involved in the development of NEXT and the NEXT Innovation Center. He's the board of directors at Chartspan Medical Technologies. He's a board member at the Children's Museum of the Upstate. Also a board member of the Foundation of South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. Peter's former roles include CTO at Single Fund, financial advisor at Morgan Stanley, and options and securities principal at the Open Company. Peter will talk today about these economic transformations that have been made in South Carolina. Please join me in welcoming Peter Barton. Accelerator, which is um, defined that term in our, for us a little bit differently than what you guys do. But our accelerator is a program, so it's a three month program uh, that happens to run in a facility for startups. Um, but that means we fund them, we provide capital to fund them, we mentor them for three months, and then we help them raise outside capital and kind of turn them back into the wild. Um, so if you hear me talk about Accelerator today, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, we run ProWork, which is basically the physical space for both freelancers and startups. Uh, we do education for both kids and adults. We can focus around the software community. Uh, and we run events. Uh, we can specifically uh, focus on the uh, software community. And so I moved to Greenville in 2006 uh, and got involved with a group called Next. Uh, Next was interesting. Um, I lived all over the states. Uh, and usually when you move to a new city um, as a software entrepreneur, it's usually a small venture. And so you get thrown in a small business group in the chamber, um, which is a very eclectic group. Uh, usually not a lot in common with a software company who's looking to sell nationally, <coughs> nationally raise venture capital, and have an exit at some point. Um, so Next was a unique spin-out of the chamber in Greenville. Uh, they actually created a separate brand, realizing maybe some of the young entrepreneurs didn't identify with this kind of activity with the chamber. Um, but it's chamber-owned and operated, uh, but groups specifically focused on CEOs of technology companies. And technology find, defined in a very broad sense of the word, so not just software companies or hardware, uh, as in computers, but life sciences, nanotech, advanced manufacturing, all those kind of things. So basically any business that is looking to scale, sell nationally or internationally, has IP, and has some, uh, some kind of exit strategy. So next uh, was for 2006, this is right when I moved uh, there, the initial programming was just a CEO best practice. So we would get together once a month and basically just share stories. What are the challenges? we face. Uh, it wasn't a lot of guest speakers at the time. It was mostly a small group that we could share real struggles in our business, uh, as well as wins and, and share those to kind of benefit the group. Uh, today, this group is 120 members, and that's just CEOs. Uh, we're really proud of that number in the city our size and have 120 tech companies uh, actively engaged. 
So in 2008, kind of one of the fruits of Next that's going to come out of this group was uh, we were all identifying with having capital issues. So we're raising capital and venture capital going on the West Coast and kind of all those things that you hear over and over again. Uh, there was plenty of capital in, in our own backyard, uh, but it wasn't organized, right? So to raise capital, angel capital for a new venture meant you know going to 50 lunches, or 20 lunches, and you know, lots of individual meetings to try to raise you know $250,000 or $300,000 to get the product to market. Um, so we organized that group, we put together or put together a group of about th uh, 300 angel investors. Um, and uh, organize them in a formal group called uh, UCAM. Uh, familiar with Angel Networks, basically two models, a fund model, where we put some money in, or more like a venture capital fund, and then the individuals who follow on. There's a network model, which is basically a group gets together and votes, and you can decide how much money to put in. We are a network model, um, and to date, um, the group has uh, put out, and this is a couple months old, maybe these numbers, but 31 companies have been invested for $8.4 million. <coughs> 2009, we built the Innovation Center. So, um, actually led this project, but it has the same name as the group, but they are two separate things. So, we have Next the Group, that is uh, you know, made up of 120 different tech companies. Um, one of the things we realized is we're spread all over our small town, but never see each other. We're up and down Main Street, but unless it's the CEO of Best Practice Group, I never see you. Um, so, that's okay. I mean, we can figure out lunches and coffees, but it makes the real challenge for recruiting key talent. Um, so a lot of us were trying to compete with Google or Facebook for a key engineer and flying a guy from San Francisco. And even if he really loves the opportunity to run companies, you know, there's a huge risk factor for them. If it doesn't work out, if your business fails, what do I do? I have to move my family back across the country for the next job. So to kind of combat that, we were uh, getting groups together. So when we try to recruit key talent, we got to lunch with seven or eight other CEOs. And I'd say, listen, I want you, but if it doesn't work out, there's seven other guys at the table who want you. Um, they'd all get resumes and, and network together. And that works, but it's a huge lift to try to get eight CEOs together every time we want to recruit key talent. So we built a facility that we could co-locate uh, and solve that challenge as well as many others, just kind of get together and rubbing shoulders uh, and see what happens with sparks flying. Um, so we, we built a, it was an interesting process, entrepreneur-led, so this was not a, a real estate development project that the city or the real estate developer-led. Um, me and two of the other founders of companies got together to survey the group. You know, what do you rent today? What are you paying? When's your lease up? Uh, are you interested in locating together? If so, what part of town? Um, all those kind of key amenities. <coughs> then we went and pitched the largest real estate developer in town and said, listen, here's the metrics. None of us will be big enough to be an anchor tenant. Um, but here's what we're able to pay, and here's what's important to us. Um, luckily, the real estate developer liked what we were doing. Uh, we hopped in the car and literally bought this building that day, um, which that's not a normal scenario. Um, but it was a great project. He let us lead throughout the project. So it was a private real estate development. There's no subsidy by state or city or county. Um, but he really let us uh, drive the project. So we bought the building, nine months later opened it. Uh, it was a pharmaceutical supply. Uh, warehouse, uh, had no windows or doors, and uh, did a ton of work to it. But literally every Monday throughout the project, the entrepreneurs got together and made the decisions about what was going to happen in the building. Uh, we, we pushed for lead certification, that means it would drive rent up a little more than the target price, uh, and that was our decision. Uh, Finishes and all those types of things. In addition to that, the real estate developer let us control who the tenants were, um, which was great for us. Because we, we wanted collaboration, that was the goal of the building. And so having service providers or other folks in the building who might sell to us, which kind of kills the, the collaboration, um, being willing to have the open door. Um, so we vet, so every tenant that wants to lease space, the real estate developer sends our way and says, you, these guys are a good fit for the culture. Um, the business, was, the building was 100% leased, I think four months after we opened, uh, and we've got a huge waiting list and, and in the process of building a second floor. Today, you know, 60,000 square feet, 27 companies, and it really split into two different, um, the top floor is 40,000 square feet, and it's pretty traditional space. Uh, it runs about a square foot for three year term, at pretty much market rates. The downstairs is 20,000 square feet, and there's no leases. So it's really startup friendly, you can come in with 30 day notice, uh, you can take off, and most of those spaces are small, cubicle or executive offices. 2010, we started uh, RailSide, which is a co-working facility. Um, <coughs> And so this co-working is used a lot in the real estate world. Starting to look like your co-work pretty often. Um, 
we actually started co-working a little bit before this, but this is when we moved into the most recent facility for co-working. Um, interesting, our code is very different than most. So most uh, co-working facilities um, are focused on startups. Ours is not. So the next innovation center is where our startups go. Uh, our co-work is where our kind of lifetime independents go. So creative directors, designers, uh, independent developers um, go here. So there's about 30 people who work in this space um, who all basically run their own shop. Very collaborative, uh, and some really amazing things that come out of a space that holds 30 people. It's kind of the old general store in town. Um, we've done the design for the Gates Foundation, the United States Postal Service. Um, I think 12 or 13 venture backs, look about startups, the whole products were built here. A um, bunch of really interesting, one of our companies that was started here, Meg Whitman, sits on the board, uh, some client work and steel. Um, so you can have a, a very little space, it's 4,500 4, square feet, uh, 30 people, some pretty amazing things happen. And it's really a key part to our ecosystem. So as we're starting new young companies, they can't afford to hire a creative director um, or a full-time person who specializes in real marketing or startups. Or, um, we have those people there that can be basically hired in a fractional role. Um, and it's been a key asset for growing our startups. 2011, we started the Accelerator. Um, and yeah, the definition of that is, is our program to help launch startups, not physical space. Um, so this is an interesting opportunity. We, we built the space, startups were happening, we started the Angel Network. Um, we still had a capital issue though. The Angel, Angel Network was great for really early stage, but then we're hitting the next round, or the C round or Series A round capital. Um, and what do we do about that? Uh, this is basically in you know, the middle of economic downturn. Um, interesting series of events happened. So I was actually part of a startup at this time. We were presenting to a VC out of Boulder, Colorado. His name is Brad Feld. He was one of the founders of Techstars, uh, which is one of the very first accelerators in the country. Um, Brad kind of flipped the table on us and said, we're in the middle of this dialogue with Coffin Foundation and uh, the White House about you know, stimulating the economy at the national level. Um, and we're, it's kind of a long story, but we're interested in putting a location in the Southeast. Where should that happen? Um, so selfishly, I believe it's happening in Greenville. I had no intention of running it. Um, but brought it back to kind of the key leaders in the town and said, we need to jump on this. An opportunity to leverage a key brand, uh, partner with the White House and, and Kaufman, uh, and do something really innovative in Greenville. Uh, got a lot of momentum and no fear, as one of the things was just going to fall apart. So I decided to quit what I was doing, um, quit some of the stuff I was doing. I still had a couple roles I was playing in other companies, um, and started the accelerator. So we raised, uh, the way it works is we basically raised a one year venture fund. Um, we put $20,000 into each company that we accept. We do 10 companies at a time. It's a batch format. Um, 10 companies, they each get $20,000. We get a small equity stake. We mentor them for three months, and then we take them on the road to raise uh, their first kind of real round of capital. Um, it's a really interesting um, program for a number of reasons for our community. Um, we recruit internationally. So for the very first program, we had 324 companies apply from 19 different countries to come to Greenville, South Carolina, where not much tech was happening. Um, that was interesting. It took a ton of work to make that happen, but but we did. We had a great class. Uh, we ended up uh, didn't we ended up not taking any international folks, but we had folks from Silicon Valley, and Philadelphia, and New York, and, uh, and Houston. Um, really great group. Uh, in addition, we put together a really uh, interesting mentor network. So we put together about 100 mentors. Basically, 50% of those are local. Successful business people may not be tech. We we have not had tech success in Greenville. So they were the successful real estate developer, um, doctors, the other some kind of successful business people that we had in. And they basically played the role as kind of a host mentor. So uh, general business issues, they were great to go to. Uh, they could also open doors locally. We could sell the school system, we could sell the hospital system. They could open those doors. Uh, and 50% of the network was industry specialists that were brought in from other parts of the country. So we flew in basically 50 people from Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, Chicago. <coughs> Um, who were key roles at with tech companies, I'm sure you all have on your phone, things like Facebook and Google and Twitter. Um, as we got those folks to fly in, uh, really on their own dime, um, to come and, and give back and help some of the online partners. That benefited not only the 10 companies in the class, but the community at large. We opened up a lot of those events so other folks in the community could come in uh, and build a relationship with the Twitter or Google. Uh, today, we've, uh, this has expanded. So we now run this accelerator in Greenville, in Spartanburg, which is about 20 miles down the road, on um, Asheville, which is maybe 30, 40 miles up the road. As uh, so we run three, they're all vertically focused. Uh, so we run 
health, a health program in Spartanburg, a green tech program uh, in Asheville, and we're just pivoting to an auto program uh, in Greenville, because BMW initially was US headquarters for Greenville. Um, we do software in all those industries. We found a cluster approach uh, has been good for us. So we've had 38 companies so far, one exit, one failure, and the rest are offering. That same year, we started a conference. Kind of our key core competency in Greenville has been design. Um, that co-working crowd really has done amazing international projects. Um, so we put together a conference that was really our response to South by Southwest. Um, you know, the tech world, it's a huge conference that happens in Austin, it's happening right now. Uh, but it was basically wanting to get together with a bunch of friends and hang out and really get to talk, not be mixed with 20 other thousand people that are going to be in Austin. Um, so it was a small group, first year, uh, I think 50 people. Uh, it's grown each year, now we're at 250. Uh, people that attend on a regular basis. Really interesting format. It's unstructured for three days. So there are no speakers. There is no agenda. Um, it was a rough agenda. But the idea is every person that comes will have a 10 minute talk, uh, topic to talk about. And we break the group into small groups. So the, for the three days, you're in a group of 15 people, but it constantly rotates. So over the three days, you've met with every person in the conference in a small group format. Um, and we get pretty big names in the industry, like the head of user experience for Google. I mean, it's all Google, you know, Google search. To um, be the design team from Twitter, and from Facebook, and from GitHub. And, uh, they all come and hang out in Greenville, which gets great networking for the local community um, and gives us a real voice of a specific part of the market. Later, later that year, basically as a bolt on to the accelerator, um, again, we're still focused on fixing that capital gap. We decided to do uh, DC visits. These were interesting. One of the things we found in Greenville, and I'm guessing you guys relate here in Rochester too, although I haven't been here that long, but it's hard to get somebody to come to Greenville, but once they come to Greenville, they love it. Um, we've got just a bunch of really fun things happening on the street. So our goal is getting people there. So the mentoring in the program is, is huge. Folks come in and they say, man, this is a great place to live. Um, it's a great place for young families. Um, so we've had a number of people move back or hire people in our community to keep them there. Um, so we want to do the same thing with venture capitalists. So we put together um, a pretty amazing event, just a three-day event, uh, during kind of a foodie festival we put on. Um, we have, I think there were five James Beard award-winning chefs, and we did a Top Chef style dinner on top of one of the health buildings in town. Um, we did kind of the whole nine yards. We, BMW's got a road course, uh, we do a performance drive, it's kind of every model of BMW. Uh, we took the group and really just showed them the town. We saw the universities, we saw the next building, the accelerator, just really showing, showing it off. Uh, out of this, a number of interesting things have happened. Kleiner Perkins has made a number of investments in the community. He relocated three other investments to Greenville and kind of creating a green tech cluster around our area. But it also just kind of opened the eyes of, this is a place that I wouldn't mind coming to a board meeting, which is key for a venture investment. <laughs> you make a real venture investment, they're going to be under board. Um, and so once you can knock down the first board meeting, then they're willing to take four or five more. Uh, and then they come to do a board visit. Um, so really selling them on, it's not a bad place to, to have to go once a quarter. Code Dojo in 2012. Um, so you guys know Code Dojo, we actually don't want to for this brand anymore, so it's the exact same programming. Uh, but this really happened, I have five kids under 11. Uh, my oldest couple uh, wanted to know what dad does at work. So I found one of my friends, uh, co work, who's the guy looking down in the top picture there. Uh, he's got a big bushy beard, a really fun guy the kids all love. And so I asked him if he'd teach a class at my kid's school. We have an engineering magnet, uh, elementary school, in downtown Greenville. It's an amazing program. Uh, so they bring in like GE and they build wind turbines with elementary kids. And Michelin comes in and talks about tire engineering. BMW does engines. And, but they don't do any software. So I approached the school system and said, listen, can we come in and just do exposure? I just want to show the kids garage band and scratch. And fun stuff they can do on the web. Um, Ran into a bunch of red tape of actually getting all approved the school systems. So I said, forget it, we'll do it in my office, which is a mile away. Um, so we started this with 15 kids. Um, went great, no marketing. Had a gal in the building who worked remotely for analog devices, uh, which is a hardware company. So I'd love to do the same class for hardware, um, which is what you can see the, the wires hanging around. Um, I said, great, I'll buy the kids if you teach the class. And it's just, there's no economics. It's volunteer teachers, no cost for the kids. Um, so about 15 kits, we had the company donate 15 more kits, um, and it was a really short window, about 10 days from when she said I want to teach the class to when we said we'd start the class. Um, I asked two days before the program how many kids were signed up, it was 14. 
We sent 10 emails, we had 324 kids sign up for the next 24 hours. Uh, so we spent a couple more nights, we now do four nights a week. Uh, we do these cat classes for kids, about 30 kids per class. Um, almost all of them bring a parent who does the class alongside of them. So often there's 50 or 60 people that are taking the class, although we're focused on the kids. The goal of these classes is fun. It is not to teach you how to be an electrical engineer or teach you how to be a software engineer. It is to just show you that technology can be cool and where you can go find out more how to do it. So we do six weeks of software where they build video games every night for six weeks. Uh, and they do one, one night a week. Uh, and then they graduate from there to the electronics class where they build a video game controller. We played Nintendo for 20 years ago. It looks like we pulled the original Nintendo controller. Uh, so the kids build a game and then they build a controller that they can actually use to play their video games. They can go show their kids, their friends on the web, or grandma uh, across the country, um, how, what they're doing. From there, we just turn them on to here's how you can learn about it online, and you're welcome back to the office anytime to answer questions. Um, so we rotate quite a few kids <coughs> through every six weeks. We now run this in every city that we operate in. Then the academy. So the interesting thing with Accelerator, as we started to fix the capital gap, um, so we're funding companies. The very first thing they have to do is go hire a bunch of engineers. Uh, and with not being a large city, having talent liquidity enough, you know, people in the you know, that are quality software developers that when you need to hire 10 or a 10 there is a huge challenge in a small city. Um, so we had talked to some friends who had started something similar to this in Chicago, uh, Intensive Code School. And what this is is a three month program, same length as our accelerator, but it's full time. You can't have a part-time job, you're gonna be ours for three months. You're gonna be in, in the building probably 80 hours a week, um, with basically four or five hours of construction a day and the rest of lap time. We're gonna take you with no prerequisites. Um, we do filter, we don't take anybody. Um, but you don't need to have any technology background. Uh, at the end of the three months, we get you ready for a junior level engineering position, um, and we guarantee job placement. So the, the program is kind of a win-win-win all the way around. It's $10,000, it includes a new MacBook, um, and then guaranteed job placement. So if we don't get you a job within four months of graduation, we give all the money back for your collective situation. Um, economics work for us, the students are happy, uh, and the employers love it. Uh, we engage both startups and large employers in the process, so they basically get a three month look at the students, where they get to figure out do they fit our culture, um, are they the kind of people we'd like to hire, um, and so it just kind of works all the way around. Um, we have now taken this model as we started in Greenville, which has been a huge hit for filling that talent gap. Um, we raised venture capital for this in January with the goal of expanding to 18 cities in the southeast in the next two years. Uh, we have now opened in Atlanta, Charleston, and Durham, and Houston um, is launching next week. Um, and we'll hit a whole slew of other uh, cities in the southeast from kind of Texas to DC uh, is our main target. It's a great program. Both this and the kids are kind of the most rewarding things we do because we're really changing an individual's life. Just some fun stories, our most recent classes, small classes, usually 15 people. Um, we had a musician who was kind of trying to live on working at Goodwill during the day. He was making $25,000 a year, took the class at the end of the program, like three weeks after class ended, he got a job making 85. Uh, we had a journalist, a young gal who was making 30, at the end of the program, she had a job for 78. Uh, we've just had a number of those kind of um, it's not tons of money, but it drastically changed those people's lives. And there's filling a gap in our ecosystem. Expansive. So those are all the things we were doing in Greenville. Um, in 2013, we were approached by Spartanburg, which is literally next door. Um, you know, it's a couple miles down the road. But, um, and this was actually the textile capital of Spartanburg. Uh, Millikens uh, is still based there. Um, they said, we want this in Spartanburg. Uh, got similar challenges with revitalizing downtown. Uh, it's a great, we will do what we're doing, but in a non-competitive way. So instead of just running the exact same kind of accelerator, we launched the health program. Uh, we do co-working, we do the kids' education, uh, all in Spartanburg. And that's a picture of our space, which is this pretty typical look of most of our spaces. It's a pretty raw you know, warehouse feel. Um, later in 2013, we uh, added kind of a supplement to Coder Dojo, which was we had a bunch of kids who wanted to continue going down the road and not show their own. So we launched a labs program, which was paid classes, paid follow-on classes for kids. Um, that was great. The kids had a lot of fun doing this. We have since deprecated this. It's just, there are other places to do this, and we we're more passionate about other parts of the ecosystem. Um, so we, have, we do the Get Them Excited, 
and then point them in directions where they could do this at other places. So why do we do this? Uh, we got in. Uh, really, has been opportunity. So we did not set out to start a code school or accelerator or to build a building. It was really engaging with our community, figuring out what the holes were, as opportunities present themselves to fill the gap. Uh, so we got into the accelerator piece because of the Start of America GAN initiative, uh, which is an interesting short side story I'll tell you. But, so when we talked to Brad Feld about starting Accelerator and coming to Greenville, they're completely private venture, venture capital backed. The White the Kauffman Foundation had done a research project I think in 2010 and saying for 30 years we've been crediting small business as a whole with job, as job creators. Really it's this little tiny sliver of a small business that's high impact entrepreneurship that creates most of the jobs. Um, so the White House latched onto that and said we can't just do everything in an economic downturn, but we can figure out how to pump some money and promote this one sector. So they reached out and found Techstars. They said, we think your model in Boulder, Colorado would work in a bunch of cities. Um, so they called them and said, we'd like to scale what you're doing. And they said, we're private venture, leave us alone. <laughs> we're just really interested in Boulder. Um, that happened for about six months. We got involved in the dialogue as that kind of back and forth was going. So they kept offering to create tax codes, incentives, and we kept explaining that it doesn't apply. Like, we either don't make money or don't pay taxes, or we can afford to pay taxes, and so just don't make it any more complicated. Um, but so in that process is where we got plugged into that. So we were actually part of the original 15 uh, accelerators around the globe um, that launched when we first kicked off uh, April 15, 2011. Um, that's been fun. So I still sit on the board of the Global Accelerator Network, which is now 60 accelerators around the country, around the globe. Um, there's probably 1,500 accelerators um, around the globe, with 60 of them in the, the top, you know, probably the top 60 of, of the top 70 that are in, uh, in um, and then the other reasons were really just to, to fill issues we had. The big ecosystem, attract companies, attract talent, attract, uh, capital. What's next? Um, two different things, so, or a couple different things, but so we're aggressively expanding the academy. It's a real need, and not just in our community, but nationwide, there's a shortage of software engineers. Um, so we're aggressively expanding our code school. Um, in addition, we're really focused on the state of South Carolina, uh, part of the Aspen, Aspen Global Leadership Network. Going through a fellowship program right now, so my fellowship project is getting a coder dojo started in, in probably 20 cities in the state of South Carolina. Um, so we're in process of that. We're, we're starting down in Columbia, Charleston, Rock Hill, and Greenville right now. Um, more options and topics. So we originally started the intensive code school uh, as web design, so really front end things that happen in your browser. We've now expanded to server side development as well as mobile development, uh, and in more cities. So. We recently expanded the accelerator piece to Asheville and the Code School uh, to the city of Asheville. That is us in a nutshell. I know that's a lot. <laughs> Pretty fast, we're going to make sure there's time for Q&A. Um, so questions in the crowd? Yes. Thank you for the great talk, and congratulations on accomplishing an awful lot in a short amount of time. Other than the weather in South Carolina, what is the one factor that was critical to your success? You've done a lot. It's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's been a really, um, in, sorry, uh, really in Greenville specifically, other than kind of the state, um, Greenville has a really healthy um, public-private partnership. Um, so when things like the Next Innovation Center happens, you know, it's one developer. You know, there's no turf wars. The city came in and approved all the streets, and the county got bored. And um, often we have turf wars between the city and the county and some of the economic development groups. And, but really, in the last 10 years in Greenville, they've really gotten on board and support each other. Um, and so it's to a point where you know a young software company can go to any kind of any one of those institutions, whether it's the chamber or the city, and they'll get them to the right place to make sure it happens. Um, lots of people talk about that. It doesn't actually happen. Um, so I would say that's one of the things, quality of life's huge for us. Um, you know, once we get them on the ground, it's, pretty, it's low cost of living and high quality of life. So, other questions? Yep. Yeah. It sounds like early on you started as a uh, volunteer support driven network that enabled these things to happen. Yeah. Have you shifted now to, I'm assuming a lot of these now have 
paid sort of resource people infrastructure. Yeah. What's the transition? How did that happen? And who helped pay for that at that time? Um, so really, that's a great question. So Next is still around. So it is now spun out of the chamber. It's a standalone entity um, as of a couple weeks ago. Um, but still around, it still serves the same purpose, which is really not super early, which is where most of what we do at Diner our players is like really early. We don't have a product in the market yet. Um, we help them get there. Um, Next has really facilitated, you can afford to pay rent, uh, those kind of companies, but they're, are fast growing um, companies are really building the community. Uh, and that's really entrepreneurial led. So the entrepreneurs dictate what the agenda is, what we're gonna do, but there are support staff at Next who then help make it happen. Uh, build policy gaps and interface with universities and, and make sure that the details uh, happen. But that's still very much a volunteer organization. Um, we've been opportunistic on just other places where there are opportunities to fill a gap that doesn't need government subsidy. There's a business model around it. Um, and so that's what the INR has been, is, is filling those gaps. They each have a different business model. And the accelerator operates like a venture fund. Also, it's a lot like a not-for-profit. It's a fixed budget every year. And, the code school is very much a for-profit business. Um, the kids stuff we do is all volunteer. Um, and co-working, there's a lot of people who do co-working for a profit. We don't, I mean, we may make a little bit. Um, it's really break even, but it creates the right community to do a bunch of the stuff we do. Other questions? <coughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, Thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, so you have this uh, stream of startups that are benefiting from all of these these efforts to kind of help them move forward. What, if anything, do you do for the successful ones to ensure that they might consider staying in the community when they set up and perhaps manufacture locally or do other things locally? Yeah, good questions. One of the things we've done is um, we intentionally put no strings on any of us. Um, so that we're completely aligned. I mean, it, this applies to kind of a bunch of different things to do, but the accelerator, there's no strings attached. So, right, so we've had teams from Shanghai come and set up. Um, and we sell our best on why you should stay here, but there's no strings. And at the end of the day, the iron yard's not selling. Like, we're completely aligned with the entrepreneur, but in the three months, we invite in every group in town that will sell you on why you should be here and why you need to be in downtown and if there's some perk, you know, for something. Uh, so we just try to set the stage where that can happen. And that's really the role of those kind of 50 local mentors, is it's the guys who own most of the buildings in town, it's the guys who sit on the boards of all you know, uh, school systems and yeah. foundations in town. So we just try to set the, set the table, uh, let other folks uh, clean that up. Um, and that's been taken very well with entrepreneurs, because we really are aligned with them. We're not pu pushing or twisting their arm to stay. Um, so it's been viewed in a very positive way with entrepreneurs. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we try to do our best on displaying all the amenities of the community, but without any strengths. Um, and that's worth the whole it lets It also puts us as not competing with the other economic development entities. Like, everybody can have their role. Um, we're just there to serve it up. ecosystem and keep this ball rolling. We've got a lot to learn from, from uh, Peter and, and what they've done. We're going to a good start, but we, got, we can see we've got a long ways to go. And we're going to need everybody in this room to help us get there. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.